Good morning. We will call the February 25th, 2020 special call meeting for the Jackson City Council to order. We will please stand. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to be here today. Thank you for allowing us to, to serve the city of Jackson and the residents that we have here. We ask that you give us the wisdom and the wherewithal to make decisions that best benefit our city and our communities and our neighborhoods. I ask you to bless us as we serve you and continue to do so throughout the day. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Item three is roll call. Sharon, I think you'll find that all council members present with the exception of Councilman Pickens. Yes, sir. Item four is approval of the minutes from the February 4th meeting. You have that in your packet. If there are no additions or corrections to the minutes, those minutes will stand approved as read. And no proclamations. And so we'll allow, we'll allow invitation for public comment this morning on, on our new business item. So we'll get to that. The only item we have on our agenda is consideration of approval of documents relating to the public-private partnership dealing with the construction of a new Madison High School, including sublease agreement, the CRA TIF fund contribution agreement, agreement for the distribution of surplus purchase amount funds, quick claim deed and city owned by the city and JCM project site to the CRA, quick claim deed deeding consolidated parcels owned by city, county, and school district at JCM to the CRA. And this time I'll call on our superintendent, Ray Washington, if he would come and give us an overview. Good morning, Mayor, Council. Good morning. Good morning. Um, brief overview of uh, the project and how we got here for us. Uh, three years ago, um, when Dr. Jones was superintendent, we were brought upon um, looking at all of our schools and the viability of each one of them as far as renovating, replacing, and what we would need to invest in them. When it came to Madison, it was pretty clear that it would take over $14 million to repair it. Um, the theory or question came about, would it be easier or better to replace Madison versus repair it? At the same time, I believe even before uh, 2017, it had been flirted with the University of Memphis at Lambeth about using one of their existing buildings to move Madison to. When that didn't work out just because of the width of the hallways and trying to convert a dorm into a school building just wasn't feasible, the thought was where the Epworth building was torn down at, could we build a school there, add additional parking where the current soccer field is, or uh, was, and uh, make it a more viable place and a viable learning center for our students at Madison, and also enhance the campus of the University of Memphis at Lambeth, and would add more dual enrollment opportunities for the students. So we embarked upon that journey. Dr. Jones and I were looking at different methods of financing, all right? So we're looking at different uh, municipal bond type issues or ways that we can construct a financing model that would work. Some of us the new market tax credit concept and found out that the lift had been built with that same model. So we had an example of how it had worked in this city already. I was not as familiar with it, but I became familiar with it and found out that we'd done something that way we contacted, uh, at that point, Mr. Crocker, who had executed that lift building project, to talk about would he be interested in looking at building schools using that same method. At the same time, we were looking to bring JCM back online, either as a K-8 or a junior, senior high. At one time, we thought about bringing it back as a K-8 school to replace Alexander, but we thought we'd be better suited to bring it back as a junior, senior high to relieve pressure off several schools within the district. So that's how we concluded to come to this process of new market tax credit to help revitalize each community on both sides of Highland. Both schools are needed for various reasons and different reasons, but both are needed. So in, in synopsis and a short version, we knew we needed to build a new Madison. University of Memphis at Lambeth was willing to donate land and property. Well, University of Memphis, they were willing to support building a the school there. JCM was needed at the same time for a different reason. We saw where we could renovate that school, add square footage to it, and do some things that would be great for that community and bringing that school back to East Jackson. Is there any more 
questions or do I need to get more detail, I'd be happy to. Uh, we've done this several times. And, um, Is there any questions for the superintendent? I don't mind talking about it at all. Yeah, Mr. Washington, uh, <clears throat> one thing I'd heard uh, in regard to the new Madison building, uh, obviously the current campus has uh, a rather large theater that they use for mm -hmm. assemblies and, and various other activities. Um, assuming we get the school built over on Memphis campus, uh, what what facility would, would fill that need? What's the plan there? So well, there's two uh, uh, facilities in our facilities use agreement with them. We currently have a facilities use agreement with Lambeth to use some of the athletic fields. We expanded that to use their, um, their theater, which is right behind the proposed building, and their chapel. Now, a couple times a year, maybe once or twice, they may have the whole student body in one place. And the chapel will be adequate, more than adequate for that. For their theater department, of course, they have a theater room in the new school, but uh, right, right behind it would be the theater that they could do performances, practice, do whatever they want, which is a part of the facilities use agreement that we have with the University of Lambert. So although they will, their theater won't be necessarily in the school, it'll be right behind the school. As soon as you walk out the back door, the theater's right there. Thank you. Mr. Washington, what's the capacity of the theater in the chapel? Do you know off the top of your head? Now, the, uh, I know the chapel is over 500, and I believe the theater is around 260. Okay. Uh, the current theater at Lambeth is about 260. Okay. But the chapel is over 500. And what's the capacity of Madison proposed? Madison? The proposed capacity of Madison when relocated to? Oh, between 550 and 600. Okay, so yeah. we have a capacity of 500, and we have 100 people plus staff. I want to make sure I heard your question right. When we were ta I was talking about the amphitheater and the chapel, the chapel there could hold, yeah. Current Madison has 438 students. I think they maxed out one point near 500. That's okay. the, ma the biggest it's ever been. What we propose, at least a 10% opportunity for growth or more. Okay. So that's why we said 550 to 600, because you just never know how things will go fall with students. My, my question was in regards to the capacity of Lambeth's facilities, and as you just spoke to, uh, that the that the whole student body will have to get together multiple times per year. My question was, what's the capacity of the chapel? The, it, 600, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Washington, you stated that uh, building a new JCM would help with overcrowdedness that you have at Liberty right now. Yeah, well, I said it's pressure on Liberty. Um, Liberty, you know, is a unique situation where you combine um, a lot of different neighborhoods, right? So you've got a lot of extra students in one place. So when we talk about overcapacity, uh, we're not just talking about numbers of, but the students that are there in combination with the amount makes it seem as though there's 2,000 <laughs> when it's really 1,000, okay? So when we talk about that school having been built for 700 students, we have um, at one point 1,100 in it. We're back down to around 900 now. We talk about North Parkway with the same situation. We talk about the zone for Southside that comes all the way up to North Parkway. We talk about open enrollment from that area going to the north side. That school will impact at least four or five different schools uh, easily. Even Northeast Middle School is impacted by the closing of Tigret, which I keep re reminding people we closed Tigret also along with JCM. So we've impacted several schools in the area, and we would then readjust that 6 through 12 school to accommodate what it should accommodate is that zone through East Jackson. It would be accommodating what it should accommodate versus having all those students dispersed throughout the district. So how many students will be at JCM? If, if Approximately 800. Uh, we're looking at about you know 400 high school, 400 middle school. <coughs> of course, you have 6th, uh, 7th, and 8th grade, and then 9th, 10th, and 11th, 12th grade. So um, um, we're working to make sure that school is around 800, and that will relieve the pressure of all those things I just described. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Mr. Washington, good morning. Good morning. With respect to Jackson Central Mary, and you're talking about the collaboration of Lane College and JCM, can you tell me how that is going? Yeah, of course, we're talking about Madison, but the collaboration with Lane as it relates to this whole public-private partnership is that they currently use the band and choir room, which was the formal auditorium, and we'll continue to allow them to use that as a part of this agreement. We'll have our own band and choir room separate from that in the old phys ed gymnasium. That's where we'll have our band and choir room. So we continue to collaborate with them 
We're working with them right now as they want Lincoln as a place to help their educational um, education program to get uh, started. So we work, and I talk to Dr. Hampton often about various ideas on how we can collaborate and work together uh, constantly, but we do intend to allow them to use the same space they're using now for their band and choir to continue to use that space. And we'll have a dividing wall between our students and their students. So this is the last piece the city council voting of the map of the credit yes approval mm -hmm. is that correct uh, yes yes mr. sir mayor and mr washington yes yes okay so yes as the city does um, uh, ponder uh, the madison project these two projects are tied together and uh, for the benefit of the close to five million dollars 4.9 million dollars in new market tax credit that will help to offset any concerns of of uh, you know, disinterest or whatever it may be, uh, we have this money coming back to us uh, to help offset and um, offset these projects. Mr. Chairman, do you have any more presenters with respect to finance? Yeah, we, we have we have several that we're going to talk through today on the, the financing, the, the project, the documents. And so I'll, I'll yield until that time. Okay. In terms of yeah. the building size. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, are you saying that our high schools are overcrowded now? Is that what you're saying? What I'm saying is yes, we, we have a, a situation where we have more students in some schools than we would want. Yes. Northside, Southside, and Liberty are full to capacity, is what you're telling me. Preferably, I want to speak about Liberty. Southside now is more full than it had been in, in the past, given the zone has been moved all the way up to Parkway. Historically, um, north side, excuse me, south side has been around 800 students. It's closer to 900 students. And then now. we're talking about now giving away a school. Well, Lincoln Elementary, yeah, that, that school uh, is an elementary school that was moved to uh, Whitehall with an addition. Whitehall was damaged during a storm, okay? We had insurance proceeds. And we saw it better fitting to invest $3 million in Whitehall along with the insurance to invest $8 million in Lincoln. Okay, so that was a financial decision also. So we had a school sitting idle that was damaged due to a storm. Those students moved to Nova Elementary. That was a pre-K center that moved to Nova. We had Lincoln with close to $8 million in repairs needed. So we saw it as a better investment to expand Whitehall, add an addition to it, and add about three million, three and a half million dollars to it to have a bigger school and a better school than we had at Lincoln. Yes, we went through that process also. There's many schools and many things that we're going through in this process in this 10 year plan that have an impact that we are actually trying to have a financial savings versus just putting money in the schools constantly over and over again. So that was a determination that was made. What was the best way to spend money? Adding to Whitehall. We're starting to fix to do it, I think. Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's what that's we evaluate all the time. That's what we evaluate every day. Whether it's repairs or whether it's renovations or whether we should uh, do something different is what we have to go through. Councilman Pretty. We're being asked to build this school and then we have no, nothing as far as jurisdiction on anything with it. We're just giving, giving away uh, nearly $20 million is what y'all are asking us to do. Well, I think the actual number is around $13 million, and what we're asking to do is invest in the community, sir. Mr. Washington, in regards to the building size uh, at the Madison Project, can you speak to the process of engagement with the faculty and administration at Madison and sure. where they are? Uh, do they feel that this building will be adequate for their needs? Yeah, how we started that process was that we spoke to the principal, asked him to put together a committee of teachers, um, his, uh, his specialty teachers, his science teachers, a committee of teachers around, well-rounded group to help us evaluate the building. So out of that, we met several times um, throughout the last two years, uh, showed different renderings, drawings, schematics of what it could be, they gave input as to what they wanted, even down to what side of the building and what floor that they would want the theater on versus the band room versus the choir room, what rooms needed acoustics, uh, what didn't, the elevator size. I mean, we got that much in detail. We 
chose to put the chemistry labs on the third floor so that the vents could go out because the top of the roof versus the side, um, the biology labs on the second floor. So we went through many, many details with that committee that um, Principal Guthrie put together. And um, so we felt good about what we were doing. We felt good about the square footage. Um, many of the rooms um, right now over at the current Madison are very small, five to 600 square feet. The smallest room within our design is 711 square feet or greater. So we did a lot of work to make sure we were touching all the right buttons when it came to uh, the staff data. We did a lot of work. Okay. I have a question, if I, wait, if I may. Yes, oh, I'm sorry. Wallace. Go ahead. Okay. Good morning, Mr. Washington. Morning. Thank you so much for being here. Mm -hmm. I've heard the word that you've been mentioned, zoning. Do you foresee new zoning for the schools in yeah. our area? Yeah, we would have to at that point, and uh, we already kind of have touched on that with our um, with our assessment people and our um, looking at what makes sense streetwise mm -hmm. and zone wise to accommodate what we want to accomplish with JCM. And once again, the impact is we talk about liberty a lot, but it's more far reaching than just liberty because several schools are impacted. And uh, I keep reiterating that we closed Tigrid also, which impacted not just the northwest part of the county that was zoned for it, but some of the central part of the city that was zoned for Tigrid also. So there's a lot of modifications that can happen with the new JCM to the benefit of the school district and the community. Thank you. Councilman Brooks. Yes, um, and I apologize. I didn't no. mean to, to talk over uh, Madam uh, Councilwoman. Uh, Mr. Washington, I, I have two questions for you. Have you interacted at all with the Madison Parent uh, Association group relative to any, relative to the new Madison at all? No, I haven't talked to the committee. Okay. And uh, can you speak to how important the neighborhood schools, uh, that concept will be uh, to JCM and East Jackson? Sure, so you know, currently you have an elementary school on the same street, basically Alexander. <laughs> could have a 6 through 12 school of JCM and Lane College right behind it. So essentially, you could go K through 16 on the same street. We know schools are anchored for building and developing, developing communities. That's why you want to build schools within communities or where the community, communities can develop around them. So with JCM, we see it as a potential anchor for new development and redevelopment. And that's part of the purpose of this, is to uh, look to try to redevelop both uh, on the uh, east side and the west side of Highland, with the Madison being um, further anchor on that side of the street, and JCM hopefully um, working towards Hayes, Royal, and those streets as far as redevelopment and making people want to live there because of the schools that are there. We're, we're experiencing growth in academic achievement at Alexander. We look to do the same thing when we able to do that at JCM to help our students not just, it's not just about buildings, we're trying to convey create better learning environments for our students overall. I mean, that's what all of this is about. Whether we talk about construction, renovation, we're trying to get better work environment for teachers and better learning environments for our students. Mm -hmm. And so with that, we hope to build a better community around that school. So Mr. Washington, the students that are currently bused to Liberty and other schools, will they be able to walk? to the new JCM? Well, certainly some of them live in that area and could walk if they wanted to. It'd be e Another factor that people don't consider is ease of parents to get access to parent-teacher meetings or to the school. That was my next question. Of course, Liberty's on an island when it comes to residential. I mean, there's an industrial community around it, but there isn't a house within two or three miles of Liberty. So given uh, what we deal with and what we understand is sometimes parents just can't get to school. Right. All right? Or if a student misses the bus, they can't get to school. Right. All right? So with this, we'll enable that part of the community to at least have access to a school other than by school bus. Right. We don't even have a city bus that goes to Liberty. That's correct. So parent, you, you would, you would uh, envision parent involvement uh, increasing exponentially? I fully expect it to increase because some of the feedback we get is that we can't get there. Can't get there. Not that they don't want to get there. Right. They can't get there. Thank you. Any other questions for the superintendent? Mr. Washington, at the end of our budget committee meeting, um, we had some discussion about the renderings that were put out to the public. And um, I, I believe I made you aware at that point that, that that was, we were bound by confidentiality from doing that in the pre-development agreement. 
uh, the pre-development agreement stated that uh, we, us, the county, and the school system, all partners must agree before putting out renderings and documents in the field that, that I'm accustomed to. Uh, we do that, that's set up in a way so it doesn't put undue expectations upon these bodies to, to approve things when the public expectation has been raised to a certain level. And uh, could you speak to how that decision was made? Well, yes, it evolved from um, the two-year discussion of these schools, and at a point um, in talking to different school board members and just within our office, we said, well, what if we do some sort of showcase to show everyone, because there's been a lot of talk about these buildings, nobody's seen them, nobody knows what's going on, that, that's the field. So let's just show people what we intend to do. So we set that up not to be contrary to the city or the county or anywhere else. We thought it was just a good way to display what we've been talking about. Um, it wasn't a matter of, well, we're gonna do this no matter what. I didn't realize that I was doing something wrong, to be honest with you, when I, when I created that, um, that day. And do, do you understand the issue that at, that at that point, the city had not been contacted in regards to the additional funds that it was gonna be necessary to build the building? And so we go to the public and show them what they, and start to establish expe expectations of what they're going to receive without having financial discussions. Yeah, at that city. point, at that point, I don't, well, I know that we hadn't even done any uh, bidding to know what the final number would be. Yeah. yeah at that point, it, it, it was shortly, we hadn't done anything financially. It was shortly after that that Mr. Crocker came to the city with a number of $15.6 million mm -hmm. uh, prior to his bids being sent out. That's correct. Uh, and after, the public had already been seen the, the documents and had an expectation of what they were to receive. So yeah, like it, you it, said, I agree. I mean, we showed the, the I, I took the initiative to try to show the public what was going on. There had not been a bid process yet. We didn't know exactly what the number would be. There was a range that everybody felt was an educated guess at that point. But of course, we didn't know until we got actual bid. Yeah. That's correct. Uh, can Mr. Thomas come up and speak to the to the bid process, if, if you wouldn't mind? If I may, before he comes up. But uh, and, and so what you're saying, Mr. Washington, is is that there was nothing nefarious. You had not colluded with Mr. Crocker or the architectural firm or anyone else to circumvent this process not or at all. We, anything I, like that. Primary contact with uh, Ms. Regime at the architectural firm, Mr. Bucos, and another lady, Mary. That's who we dealt with. 90% of the time, sure. or 95% of the time. those were the people that were there at the... That were there, and that's who we talked to, that's who we met with, that's who we conference called with, that's who we talked to when we talked about these buildings, the schematic, the design, and the classroom. That's who we talked to. Thank you. If I may, to clarify that point, uh, my intention was not to uh, say that anything nefarious had happened. My intention was to outline that there seems to be some ignorance around what was being asked or what was proposed in the pre-development agreement and where we are today. Uh, and and that there, there's multiple points that potentially will be brought up today in regards to that. So let's bring Mr. Thomas up, and after we get talk with them, we'll bring up attorneys Lattimore, Lattimore and uh, Cobb to talk about the the agreements that are, that are lined out in our motion. So when he gets done speaking. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Um, good morning. Good morning. But one of the questions that I hope you could clarify for us is, uh, it's my understanding when, when schools uh, go to, to do construction projects that they have to go through what's similar to the city and the county through a, a competitive bid process. Could you share with us why that's not the case in, in, in this project? Well, primarily it's because the school system nor any governmental entity is building this. Uh, we have a development agreement that we're going to be entering into, and the developer is then going to contract with the construction company to build the schools. So it's a lot like we, that was done at the lift. Uh, you know, it did not have to go through those same processes because it is a public private partnership. And that's what allows the difference. For example, if we build a school anywhere else, and we're not going through this public-private, we're going to have to go through the competitive bid system. Mm -hmm. But the district didn't handle any of the bids in this. This was all done by a private entity. Mm. It was my understanding that the district had representation at the bid, during the bids, is that 
Is that correct? Yeah, Alan yeah. Powell, our facilities director, was a part of it and was um, around the whole process. And what I meant throughout, by that, throughout the process. What I meant by that, it wasn't controlled by the district. But it was. We we didn't put out the bids. We had a representative there, but we didn't. We weren't in control of the bids. Hmm. Okay. What? Why do? Why do? Uh, governmental bodies have to go through a competitive bid process? Well, the process, the, the thought process is that you want an open and transparent process. Mm. And you also want to make sure you get the best uh, bang for the public's money. Absolutely. So that's, that's the thought behind the com competitive bidding process. Okay. That's all. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, Nick and Lewis. We've decided to split the responses to difficult questions. Go to Nick. I'll take the <laughs> easy ones. You might as well go back and sit down there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for, for coming up here. If you could, you know, in items, discuss items A, uh, probably all the items, because there is some some documents that, that are that attorneys have gotten together on to approve those items. I'm just kind of go through those and put any questions on any of those items A through E. Let me give a general overview of the process. Do we have it? Just uh, sorry, get the details. Just all the items that are that go along with it. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I see we're going to have kind of a, a rotation of uh, people come up here. Mm -hmm. um, we, we've just spoken with the superintendent. We have our um, legal uh, staff here. Uh, as, who else could we expect so that we can direct questions appropriately? I mean, if, any, any questions you have that someone's better to answer finance questions, we'll ask Mr. Arnold to come up. Um, any, any questions you have that someone has the expertise in, that we'll bring them up. Okay, thank you. This is a public-private partnership trying to leverage uh, a redevelopment idea to get tax credits. Uh, there are multiple documents between several entities. Starts out with the school system and their request for financial support. Uh, the county and the city have agreed uh, to work together to provide that support through a vehicle called the Community Redevelopment Association. Those are the players in this. And Nick has been the primary wordsmith going through the documents, working with Mr. Thomas, working uh, with Ms. Maroney for the county, and uh, trying to get an agreement that everybody could look at, understand, and uh, that's what's before you, multiple agreements to achieve one purpose, which is <coughs> using the development tax credit for about $5 million to hopefully uh, develop new schools, attract a better uh, make a better school system and to assist the redevelopment of the uh, downtown area. Lewis, have you reviewed through these documents in detail? No, I haven't done the details. I will ask Nick to do that. Uh, that requires a vast amount of time and the availability. He's the one that has been, along with Jerry Spore, looked at the details of the documents. And so the fine points of that, I'd defer to him. Mm, okay. <coughs> Any questions for the attorneys? Just for clarification, Nick, you represent, is it the CRA in the official capacity working with Lewis and us as the city? Or? I think so. We've been working kind of in conjunction with the, you know, I guess I, I do represent the CRA. I, I go to meetings. I, I um, represent them in, in legal matters that they need. But, yes, we've been kind of all working in conjunction with the city, with Lewis and Jerry Spore, um, for the city and the CRA. Okay. Good morning, Nick. I, I have a cursory knowledge of how new market tax credits work. Uh, I guess my question is, is it, is it true or is it correct to say that um, the reason the quote unquote price tag has gone up for both schools is because uh, we didn't get uh, as much through the new market tax credit process as we thought. Is that correct? Um, I, health, the health community 
community representatives may be able to better okay. answer that. I think it's more tied to construction costs rather than um, the new market tax credits. I know that 100% of what they were asking for, looking for in the new mm -hmm. market tax credits were not um, obtained, but okay. I think it's mainly probably the construction costs. Okay, costs. thank you. That, that answers my question. We have members from Healthy Community and the CRA here, if the council has questions for them. In, in terms of the latest CRA uh, agreement and contribution, uh, could you run us through, I know there was uh, originally a resolution uh, or maybe a commitment uh, with a, a floor of 150,000. Could you run us through uh, where we are to date and any changes from that original resolution? Uh, yes, the, the CRA TIF fund contribution is, I think, what you're referring to, and that is the CRA's commitment to contribute a certain percent, 75 percent, of the increase of the county TIF and the city TIF using the base year of 2017. When this project first came on board, uh, the, the CRA said, you know, we, we will be involved in the deal as long as the county joins a TIF, joins the TIF, it creates a TIF. So the county did that. Their base year, um, from when we look at the increment tax revenues, is 2017. And we said that we, we would contribute, the CRA said that they would contribute 75% of those funds that they receive every year um, towards this project. We also said that we would use, contribute 75% of the city funds generated from the city TIF using that same base year. Um, that was the plan. Uh, somewhere along the way, um, there is a, a need or request for a baseline um, contribution from each TIF of $150,000 each from the county and city. So we had put that in the agreement. The city or the CRA approved that. that baseline TIF. Um, at the time, it looked like um, with the with what the TIF projections would look like, that would be no problem. Then somewhere, and then um, I believe at West Tennessee Healthcare, the hospital, there, there were certain properties taken off the tax rolls, which significantly impacted the, the CRA's ability to have that $150,000 baseline. So at that point, um, we, we had to take that out. We, now it's just the flat 75% of the city TIF and the county TIF using that 2017 baseline. Um, right now, uh, and then also the CRA will contribute a total of $600,000 um, at closing to both projects, $300,000 to each project at closing. So what we've said is that the, the, the CRA will receive TIF payments um, this year, this spring sometime based on taxes collected last year from both TIFs. So the, the CRA, under the current documents, will keep those payments, but those payments will be used to fund that $600,000 at closing. And then beginning next year in 2021, and it'll start the 75% contribution from each TIF. And that's over an eight-year schedule, correct? I believe that's correct. It, it ends... Um, from taxes collected in 2027. So the payment received in 2028 will go towards the project. And what that is, that's timed out with the, um, the county did their TIF for nine years. So whenever the county TIF expires, that's what mm -hmm. that's tied to. Could, could Mr. LaFoon comment on where we are? Do we have a good understanding of what that TIF contribution will be next year, a per projected And, and my next question would be in regards to the $150,000 letter of support from West Tennessee Healthcare, and and the way that that's worded, it could be a could it be abutted to the Spire project? I would not 
Okay. Mr. Mr. Cobb, could you comment on that? I haven't seen that document, but Nick and Jerry Ford have worked on that. I'll be glad to take a look at it. Do you have a copy of that? Hmm. Yeah. yeah, that's it. If you'd like to read it, Mr. Yeah. Cobb, it's right there. I think from it's important for us as we're considering this um, it's a complex deal right and there's been um, entities like West Tennessee Healthcare University of Memphis willing to partner with us and contribute um, as we're looking at that piece there one one of the most recent developments this past week that has been brought to light is the commitment from the University of Memphis uh, Foundation and um, I think I've, I've been approached by many community members and, and others involved in this partnership of, hey, that's great news. Um, now we can move forward. Uh, we received that document yesterday, and, and I'm a little curious about the language, um, if either of you could speak to it. Uh, their commitment um, not to exceed 908,000, uh, but then goes on to say the commitment shall serve as a last resort call. It would only be applicable after the city demonstrated that all other avenues have been exhausted and shall be considered on an annual basis and shall not be cumulative. I, I'm not an attorney, so I'm trying to make sure I understand. Is that what that is really stating as what's the last resort call uh, after we've demonstrated all other avenues and can this be reviewed annually? I'm sorry, yeah, not, not to confuse you, I was, I was skipping over to the University of Memphis mm -hmm. uh, foundation do, contribution. Do we think it'd be helpful for someone from the University of Memphis to come up and address that? Possibly, but I, from, I also from the foundation, that was not from the University of Memphis because Board of Regents doesn't allow them to, to invest in projects like this. Um, and yeah, correction, foundation, yeah, yeah. sorry for the, the confusion there. My question is yeah. the same, though. Yeah, yeah. Bobby has been in conversations with the yeah. Foundation and the University of Memphis. Okay. Uh, good morning. Good, good morning. morning. Uh, Councilman Pretty, to, to your question regarding the University of Memphis, uh, fair question. And uh, this generous contribution by the university, first off, is, Absolutely. Is, speaks volumes, of, I think, about the university continued commitment to Jackson and what, what they're doing here. And it certainly uh, it certainly is needed and it's, it's certainly appreciated. It has evolved quickly over the, the last couple of days. And specific to your question about that language, um, I guess a couple of days ago now, uh, we, we provided uh, the university some of our uh, financial analysis and pro forma uh, that demonstrated to them uh, the city's need uh, for this contribution. And uh, they had access to that uh, before they uh, uh, passed this, this amendment from their auxiliary uh, uh, foundation. So uh, I really could, could not speak internally as to why they uh, felt the need to include this, this particular language. Uh, I was not on the, uh, not involved in the original conversations with them, but what I'm trying to articulate is, is that I believe we have demonstrated to them, uh, to their satisfaction based on some of the financial performance that we provided to them that the, that the need exists. So. That, that was a, Council, that was a conversation that, that Dr. Rudd and I had about the foundation is that our, our projections and pro formas demonstrate that there will be a need for that assistance over the next four years. And so that's why the, you know, in case you know, someone decides to, to donate the city a huge ton of money in the next few years, then we will need those funds to, to make those rent payments. Those will be needed and they will be, um, it will serve, the pro forma serves as the, the proof of need. So and I don't that, want to appear ungrateful because I, I, I sure. totally agree, Ms. Arnold, and thank you to the University of Memphis Foundation for that contribution. I just, as we've looked at these things and we are basing the decision off sure. that financially, right. I just, I was a little confused on the language of right. can we count on that 
for sure over the next four years. I understand. Yeah. That's a very good question. That's the and, and so, Mr. Mayor, so I'm clear, you're saying that we have demonstrated yes. this, and this is a last resort, especially in light of the fact that the, uh, I would suggest that the Budget Committee did not approve this. So going forward, yes. we have made this demonstration to them satisfactorily. Yes, and we, we will continue to, to give updates to them annually on, on our financial situation as well. I believe we were, we're required to yep. as well. Thank Mr. you. Mayor, I have, I have an answer to your question. Pull the microphone back over. Mr. Taylor, I have an answer. Uh, I was familiar with this issue. I hadn't seen this letter, but let me tell you what I understand. There was a joint project called Inspire that had land that was owned by the district, but a building that was built in a joint project. Mm -hmm. And because of some misunderstandings, it was on the tax rolls, then it was off the tax rolls, and now it's back on the tax rolls. As I understand <clears throat> this provision, what the hospital is saying is they're willing to contribute one time but not twice. Mm -hmm. And the last paragraph talks about if there are taxes that are paid above the uh, base year 2017, that's a credit for the contribution. And the district is a tax exempt from property taxes. Mm -hmm. They're willing to pay kind of like payments in lieu of taxes. But if they pay payments in lieu of taxes and then something else gets pulled back on the tax rolls, then that is payment of taxes, not payment in lieu of taxes. And they only want to have a total of 150 payments. Right. That's what I understand the discussion that has been, and that's what I understand this document represents, is they pay one time, not double taxation. And I think that's, I think that's fair. Yeah. So um, my, my question is now that Spire has been pulled back onto the tax rolls, will that be abutted against the, the $150,000? Well, is that included in Mr. LaFoon's calculation of 260? I don't know the answer to that. I don't know when the, the Mr. LaFoon. Mr. Taylor, actually, I'm told by the schedule for the subject that is represented by Mr. Taylor that the Okay. I am an attorney. That, that's the question. What, what, the, what, the paragraph, <laughs> what the paragraph says is it is taxes paid by the district, and these taxes are paid by uh, another Encompass entity. Health. Mm -hmm. And so they do not offset. Thank you. Another. That was my question. Thank okay. you for the clarity. All right, any further questions? Just we have Mr. Arnold up here. If there are any questions on I'll financials. Mr. Arnold. Uh, Mr. Pretties. Uh, yeah, oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I just wanted to go back and thank you all so much. I wanted to go back to um, Ross's question and the wording of the language with the University of Memphis. And we are so appreciative of that. But I would like some clarification. If they are going to look at this annually, I would like to have some clarification that we still could count on them with no matter if we get a large donation that that is still there for four years to help us. For, for my understanding, the conversation is, is that we, we can't ask for the 908,000 to just separate out. We have to ask annually. And so that's why that's in there, the last dollar resort to ask annually for each for the contribution. So we just can't say you committed $908,000, give us our four payments. We have to ask annually, we have to come back to them. But we feel good about, we feel good about that yes. commitment. Mm -hmm. Okay. But we have to ask, and they have to say yes mm -hmm. annually. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. First of all, I think, you know, University of Memphis Lambert have shown a major impact in our community, especially in the Lambert area. Uh, the investment they made, you know, when they shut Lambert down, I think they came and invested over, what, $16 billion, I think, in that area. So I think they have made a showing us that there are good neighbors in our community they want to be a partner with us to make sure that, you know, uni uh, the school is going to be a prosperous thing in that location. And based on what University of Memphis, uh, Lambert, West Tennessee Healthcare, and CRAs, what's the total that they'll be given to the city to help with this project? 
Let me respond to what Mr. Dodd just said. <clears throat> I was there when Lambeth changed from a private to a public institution, and there were three primary uh, forces that got together, the city, Jackson Energy Authority, and the hospital. And they had a commitment, but not a contract, with the state that they would invest in and grow that campus and re reinvest in it. And we trusted them to do what they said, and that's been, in my opinion, a very successful, important part of revitalization of that community. So, uh, as Councilman Dodd pointed out, they have shown by past deeds that they're interested in developing, growing, uh, and working with us in that area. So, mm -hmm. I think that's, Speak that's what I was saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's, it's will give me the total of what the total okay. investment is. So, if I, if I understand Councilman Dodd, your, your, your question, um, the, the CRA contribution uh, at closing, as uh, Mr. Lattimore uh, shared earlier, would be would be. I'm not sure if you wanted to include that or not include that, but that would be three hundred three hundred thousand uh, dollars. Okay. The West the West Tennessee Healthcare commitment that that's been discussed over a seven year period would be a million and fifty thousand dollars. The University of Memphis. Uh, contribution that we discussed would be uh, nine hundred and eight thousand dollars, and then uh, I believe uh, uh, Superintendent uh, Washington, in his comment, uh, kind of summarized the uh, new market tax credit value. Uh, and for uh, at least for the city, that's about right at one point nine million dollars for for the city project. So if you sum all of those up, if you intended to include all of those categories, that's, uh, that's about $4.1 million. So. To help with this project? Sir? To help support this project that's with the correct. city? Yes. Thank you. Before we move on to financing, um, Nick, since you've had an opportunity to look through all these documents, and uh, as Mr. Cobb had stated earlier that he hasn't looked at these in detail, could you attest that the, the documents that we're considering today would not put the city at any undue risk? Um, no, if we can look at the sublease agreement, the, um, the city's only obligation under the, um, the sublease agreement is to pay rent and um, to purchase the property at the end of seven years. Um, everything else under that document is the obligation of the district, the school district, as far as financial repairs, maintenance, um, insurance, things like that. Um, Change orders. Well, that, right, that's in the development agreement. Um, the city's not a, a party to the development agreement, um, but the, the, um, that, that's between um, Healthy Community Education Partners, the school district, and Healthy Community. Okay. Nick, I have a quick question. Who would own who would own the physical structure after the seven years? Right, um, that would either be that would be the school district or the city um, on behalf of the school district for the use and benefit of the school district. How does that get determined? Um, I, I don't know if there's. And let, let me speak to that. The practical difference between the two is, is zero. There are numerous schools that were owned by the city pre-consolidation. They've been placed in the custody of the school district, which the difference between that and ownership is only if they decide they want to abandon them and it costs more to de demolish them than they're worth, then we get that bill. So, uh, frankly, uh, I think it would be better for them to be owned by the district than be owned by the city, if, that, if that's the, your question. But yeah. there's no practical difference. Yeah. The, the only reason I could see is that we're making a $14 million investment uh, plus interest in the project um, with no asset at the end of the day. Uh, it would potentially be of the city's interest to look at holding onto that property uh, during 
a short period of time and then signing it over to the county. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, Attorney Cobb, you've <laughs> been going at this for years. When a school <laughs> ceased to be going, uh, ceased to become a school, it reverts back to the city and county. Well, Mr. Buchanan, I, uh, you're right. We have not agreed on that. I don't think our disagreement has been disagreeable, <laughs> but but there is within the language of the consolidation agreement that yeah. says the school, once it doesn't need the property, can sell it and keep the money. Mm -hmm. So that means if it's an asset, they get the money. Well, let me give you some examples. Two county schools, Beach Bluff closed. It's now a recreation department out there owned by the county. West High School closed. It's owned by the county. The sheriff's department is still out, is out there now, part of the county. West Jackson closed. We demolished it. The city did. Okay? I, I agree with everything you said. White Hall closed. Now, the city took it back over and renovated. Now, Lincoln is closed. The 1989 agreement states that when they cease to become the schools, they revert back to the city slash county. I don't think that's exactly what it says. I believe it is. Yeah, it is. The school system can choose instead of giving it back to sell it and keep the money, though. So That's not what I read. Okay. That's a discussion for a different day, Council. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Around the water cooler. A few, <laughs> a few more years later down the road, we can keep discussing that. No, the question was uh, from from Council. Yeah. Who, who, who owns the property? Who owns the That's property? correct. That was my question. If it ceased becoming a school, I think we've seen, and it, personal opinion. For the school system to own the property is more advantageous at the end of the day once the life of the school has been exhausted that we don't get a, a piece of property that's unusable and we have to tear down. <laughs> I, th I think there are also some conditions about we're getting property from the state and the state has uh, some input in what happens to it after it's not being A little different than a consolidation. We get good about giving the people's money away. Can we move on to financing? If that's all right. Any other questions for the attorneys? Oh, okay. Thank you. Mr. Arnold, yeah, if that's all right. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Arnold, you've presented over the last week or two a number of different variations on performance projecting uh, what we've identified as a debt service uh, issue um, uh, and also looking at how this, this potential project plays into that. Um, could, you, could you bring us up to speed on on where we are to date on understanding that debt service issue and the uh, the changes that you're proposing to our future budgets to, to take care of that. Yes, I can do that. And we have, we have worked uh, extensively in looking at different um, uh, performers and analysis. And uh, as you stated, Clearly, uh, the, the school transaction would be a debt service fund uh, transaction, so that's the reason that uh, uh, I elected to do the pro formas, you know, kind of in the debt service fund. I think it brings some, it brings some clarity uh, to that. Um, so, the purpose of doing it was to, to kind of highlight, if you will. Um, uh, the impact it would have on our debt service fund. As you know, uh, we have to have a balanced debt service fund each year. We're not uh, in a situation where we can spend more than is appro are appropriated uh, you know, in, in the debt service fund. Uh, along with the work that you described related to the school, Councilman Taylor, you know that the budget committee also asked us to include some assumptions 
and work surrounding potential funding for the city's capital budget over this period of time as well. And as the um, um, uh, performers, uh, you know, indicated, uh, uh, the city has some short-term, what I would describe short-term to mid-term challenges as in the next four years, uh, both in terms of uh, uh, not not b even before the consideration of this project or before consideration of uh, funding for future capital budgets, we have some short-term challenges for the next four years. Uh, not, to, not to regress, but this is some of the information that we provided to the University of Memphis and, and that they looked at and, and evaluating their decision to help us support us, uh, you know, in this, in this project. Uh, the school project itself, specifically over the next uh, seven years, 21 through 27, would require under uh, the uh, current understanding we have with the CRA funding up front, uh, the contribution from West Tennessee Healthcare, the contributions from the University of Memphis, the school project itself uh, over the next seven years would require uh, uh, 2.5 million dollars. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, as you're familiar with, we looked at different scenarios on uh, possible funding for our uh, capital uh, budget during that time as well. And, uh, you know, the city, in my opinion, uh, is in a position to fund uh, this project. Um, uh, certainly, the city will need to continue uh, the work that we have already started uh, together in terms of ensuring that we're operating the city as effectively and as efficiently as, as we can and uh, trying to focus on what we understand and agree are the city's uh, priorities and investments that, that make sense and the city will have to demonstrate uh, uh, the uh, um, have to demonstrate, uh, you know, some financial discipline, you know, to make decisions that will uh, result, and so, some of those decisions will be hard, but we'll have to make decisions that will result in us being able to meet our current obligations as well as uh, uh, fund this project and fund uh, um, the capital budgets that, that are required for priority projects over the next, the next several years. There, 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 there are deficits, so none of this would happen without some action being taken, you know, by the city to address that. Uh, there are there are options available. Um, uh, certainly, uh, ensuring that our appetite for new capital is is focused on very top priorities for the next uh, four years. Uh, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, um, ensuring that we're operating as efficiently as we can across the city and that we have the, uh, uh, we have the uh, financial discipline to reallocate resources that we have in the city now to, to, to meet these needs. Uh, so that's, uh, that work's been done, it's been circulated, it's been shared with all the council members, all the budget, commi budget committee members have, have, have seen that work, and uh, that's kind of where we are uh, today. Can you speak to those, uh, to those actions that would have to be taken? Sure. Potentially. Uh, potentially, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, potentially. Uh, uh, so reduction in operating expenses across the city. Uh, uh, we currently have about a $750 million uh, operating budget in the general fund. Uh, a 1% reduction is about $750,000 as uh, an example. Uh, currently, cur we currently allocate certain revenues, uh, go to um, uh, uh, certain funds. It might be that we might have to reallocate some of our existing revenues to the debt service fund as an example. Uh, uh, I think I mentioned, uh, 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 you know, controlling our appetite for capital purchases would be an, another initiative. Uh, uh, 
and certainly, you know, at some point, uh, the city is really faced with a difficult uh, revenue problem. And I think at some point, uh, 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 consideration of, of our, our revenue sources at some point might be necessary. Uh, so there are um, uh, options available and combinations of options, and, and there, there's work and uh, analysis that, that needs to be done to, I wish I could, um, speak specifically to uh, a specific plan uh, on, you know, on what we might do. Um, but there's additional work that needs to be done through the budgeting process. We're on the crust now of, uh, well, we have started our operating budget process for this next year. Uh, we, uh, we need to, st or, I'm sorry, our capital budget. We need to get started on our operating budget. So it's, it's a little premature. That's a process that we need to go through with uh, leadership uh, at the city, our directors, our employees, uh, the budget committee, this, this group to decide, you know, what are the actions that make the most sense for us to take, so. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Can we maintain our double A bond rating with what? this initiative? Can we maintain our double A bond rating? Well, I can give you uh, some thoughts on that and uh, on my opinion. Uh, as you know, we, uh, our credit rating was reaffirmed um, uh, back in, uh, what, October, something like that, with a with with stable outlook. So that's a, that's a very good place to start. Uh, I think some of the actions that the city has taken with the formation of uh, the budget committee and some of the work uh, that uh, uh, we are already uh, uh, undertaking to ensure that we operate the city as efficiently uh, as we as, as we can would, would would be would be positive. Uh, I also believe that um, uh, a city uh, taking uh, a longer range view of, of, of projects such as the school initiative uh, that at a point in the future. Um, would hopefully uh, provide great value to our community, uh, growth for our city. Uh, those types of projects, I, I, I'm confident, would be viewed favorably by rating agencies, provided we have a plan to show them how we're going to pay for it. So, uh, you know, Councilman Buchanan, it's, uh, it, it's, it's impossible for me to say unequivocally that we would be able to maintain our credit rating, but I do think that we have already taken certain actions, and the actions that we will need to take moving forward would be viewed favorably by the rating. Our agency. front balance still sits around 17.5 million. Yes, sir. So uh, at June 30th of 19, uh, our general fund fund balance was uh, 17.9 million dollars, I believe. Mr. Arnold, if, if I may, um, in, in discussing some of the challenges that uh, Councilman Taylor uh, mentioned, um, you suggested that we have currently the mechanisms in place to address those issues. Is that correct? Um, well, I think we're working uh, on the initiatives that would be required, you know, to implement some uh, you know, and that really starts with understanding what our priorities are. Uh, it also uh, starts with um, understanding maybe where across the city that we see opportunities that uh, we can operate more efficiently. That type of work is definitely underway. Right. Uh, it, it, you know, another uh, really good initiative that the budget committee has um, uh, started now is the process of uh, not looking year to year with our capital plans, but kind of looking at a five year uh, capital plan where we can plan accordingly for what we need to do and focus on our priorities. So yes, I think a lot of work is already underway. To right, and, and specifically some of those uh, suggestions and, and initiatives that have come out of the budget committee, we're implementing them as we speak, correct? That's, that's correct. Right. Yeah. And, um, We've established financial metrics and goals right. uh, to measure our, our financial performance uh, uh, through the budget committee. And so, yes, sure. lot, lots of work is right. taking place. We've, we've so. recommended hiring, hiring an auditor, correct? That's correct. Uh -huh. And uh, I, I believe that's part of the uh, work and analysis that you talked about and the mechanisms that we 
do have in place that leads you to believe that uh, you suggest that we approve this project? I do, uh, and um, I would point out, and um, I, I think it was mentioned earlier, but um, it's, I think it's important to note that um, for uh, the next uh, four physical years, because of um, 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 the, the, the existing debt service requirements for the city of Jackson for the next four years, they're significant. Um, they average $11 million a year, round numbers, for the next uh, four years. That's sort of the, the short-term challenge that, that um, I was referring to. Uh, once we get to our fiscal year 25, uh, uh, existing debt service anyway drops off from about $11 million to $5 million. So a significant improvement at that point. So I want to make sure it's all clear on that. Mayor, Mayor Conger, could, could you guys speak to uh, what you see as the role of the budget committee? Um, and, and I think in light of uh, all the work we've done, um, I think it's important for us to make this decision understanding the February 11th, the most recent budget committee meeting that we failed to bring that out of committee uh, with the recommendation. And so uh, in light of that, have there been new developments? Um, is there, how should we understand that, I think, in, in this decision here and also in our decision as we have the, the tough decisions we have to make going forward? I think we've, we've determined the bylaws of the budget committee and, and the, the formation of it that it is an advisory committee. It doesn't set the policy for the council, but it advises and gives recommendations or doesn't give recommendations. It's still ultimately the council's decisions to make to make any decisions going forward. Yep. Um, I, I would just share one point to uh, you. You're asking very good questions. Um, well, all of the council members are asking good questions. I commend you for that. Um, cur currently, the, the currently the uh, the city has um, designated a, um, a certain amount of our current property tax revenue. Uh, to the capital outlay fund. Uh, we were able to do that a couple of years ago following the, 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 the last most recent reappraisal. Uh, that's, that's roughly about $1.5 million a year. Uh, so I'm, I mentioned previously that this is what we're talking about this morning, really a, a debt service uh, transaction. Um, specifically, Councilman Pretty, to your questions of like having a plan. I, 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 I too support having a plan. <laughs> We're in the, um, you know, we've identified what our challenges are, right? And we, we need now to um, do our diligence and establish a plan and have the, the, the financial um, discipline to, to follow through and implement that plan. And, and one of, the, one of the things that we that we could do again is you know uh, try to find some operating efficiencies uh, focus our cap our capital purchase only on our top projects and and priorities but this 1.5 million dollars that uh, is currently been going to the capital out outlay fund uh, due to the fact that our existing debt service for the next four years full before any consideration of the school project, which I gave you those numbers earlier. And everyone remembers the school project impact actually does not start until our 2022 um, fiscal year. But, um, and before any additional borrowing, um, the, the city was in a position where we were going to have to take certain actions to uh, fund our existing debt service that we have today. And one of those was probably going to entail redirecting or reallocating some or all of that $1.5 million that's been going to the capital outlay fund to, to the debt service fund. And uh, when we look at doing that, all of that or uh, part of that, st staging it, you know, along with um, uh, trying again to, to, to focus our capital, appetite for capital on our very top priorities 
combined with uh, hopefully being able to find some efficiencies in our operations across the city, uh, then and you look at the debt, the debt service pro forma, then moving forward, um, it, it, you, that's how it would work. That's, that's how the decision could be made today, knowing that that's what the plan is and, you know, at a, at a high level, and that's what we're going to do. Now, the specifics, you know, are, we have to do the work to determine those, right? Um, uh, so, Mr. Chairman, so speaking, uh, speaking of the reallocation of that capital outlay money, right. Uh, to, to uh, help cover the deficits that we have in our um, debt service fund. Uh, typically, we've run about a $7.5 million capital budget a year, excluding grants. Um, when we reallocate that money, your performa shows that we're, we would, you're making the assumption that we would borrow $5 million next year with a tapered, as the budget committee has come out uh, and recommended to the council to taper that borrowing uh, through driving operational efficiencies over the next four years. Uh, if we reallocate that capital outlay money, that effectively, I've seen the, the requests from our departments, uh, right. and they're substantial. Right. Um, it's to, to get that down to a $5 million, to $5 million I mm -hmm. think is going to be very, very difficult. Yeah. And it, ultimately, as Mayor Conger mm -hmm. has stated, the, the budget committee is, it can give advice all day, mm -hmm. but it's up to the mayor's office and you to make it work. That's, that's, that's correct. Um, some of the, the financial discipline that I've referred to <laughs> multiple times now, that would, that would be involved with that. And, um, and it, it will be a, a challenge. It, it's doable. Um, um, and, and, and frankly, um, uh, Councilman Taylor, um, as I've tried to describe, I, I just, I'm going to say it even more clearly. <laughs> uh, before consideration of the school project, and I've shared with you what the impact of the school project would be over the next seven years. That's the $2.5 million number. It doesn't start until the 2022 fiscal year. Uh, before that, right, before consideration of any additional uh, borrowing to fund capital budgets, uh, we were going to have to take certain actions to fund our debt service fund in this next year based on existing debt service requirements. So that $1.5 million that is, is in our current revenue flow, that's not new revenue, that's just revenue that would be redirected from the capital outlay fund to the debt service fund. Some, of, some or all of that was going to have to happen uh, regardless. And what that will require us to do, it will put a crunch on our capital budget um, in the next few years. Um, it will require us really to um, uh, either um, uh, be, uh, 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 find some operating efficiencies or other revenues to fund our capital requirements, those priority items or to uh, be very uh, selective in um, uh, fund, uh, you know, debt issues, minimal debt issues that we have to have to move forward with the very top priority capital items. That's what will force us to do, so. Guys, we've already started that process with our department heads. If Mr. Arnold gave the, the financial pro forma outlook for our department heads so they understand where we are and what we have to look forward to with our capital needs based on the level of needs kind of need want um, and so they they understand where we are and that we have to make some tough decisions that if you have a, a vehicle with 150,000 miles you're probably going to drive another 100,000 miles uh, to make sure that we can stretch those vehicles and our assets out um, and better maintain our, our current assets before we go and purchase new assets. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Oh, oh. In the next seven years how much will we pay into this for the school. How much for that next year? How much of the people's money will we pay into it? Yes, sir. So uh, uh, that would start in year two th in our fiscal year 22, not not 21. It would start in our fiscal year okay. 22, and over uh, that period through uh, FY 27, it would total two million five hundred fifty-five thousand dollars. 
2000. Okay. Then at the end of seven years, we've got a balloon payment. We do. Of 14 million. Six, no? Nine, nine million. 9.7 million. 9.7 million. Okay. What will be the interest rate? How much will the We're going to have to borrow that money. Yeah. Uh, what, will, what will the interest rate be? Well, who knows? Uh, you know, I'm not sure what it uh, would be. I, I looked at, at those numbers, and I think uh, $2.7 million, I'm sorry, $9.7 million, at, I don't have this with me, but at 3% at three percent, uh, and we'll, there'll be about uh, another uh, 13 or 14 years left that we could amortize at 9.7 million, that that will be about $900,000 a year. A year. Under those assumptions, yes. To, to speak to the municipal bond rate in 2027-28, um, right now, what is the current municipal bond rate? Uh, you know, I haven't looked at them. Uh, I think it's around two. Our, our last transaction, but my, my, sense, my sense is um, that really rates are still um, um, historically low, maybe not historically low, but still very, very low and very comparable to what they were back in the fall when we did our last bidding. And, and what, what was that? It was two point. Um, let's see. Uh, the 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 re one the re one was uh, you know we did the new money and the refunding. Um, I don't recall. Uh, one maybe. Can you help me out? One one was not one point. I don't remember which one was two, which. Two point four was the higher of. Yeah, two. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so, have we done the analysis to to look at if if we were uh, if we or the county was to finance this uh, over, through a municipal bond, would mm -hmm. there be any savings? Uh, of course, I have not. That that analysis was done um, uh, back in um, maybe I don't know. It, it, that that I I haven't done that. Analysis. That, that analysis was prepared uh, uh, at some point in, in the past. I think, uh, of course, you have to, again, um, um, certainly take into account the value of the, uh, the value of the new market tax credits. Yes. It would be hard to, mm -hmm. to see how that could be offset. But. Yeah, so I, I've okay. done the analysis. Okay. Um, the way that at current rates, the only way that we see any savings uh, is if the interest rate is below 4% when we go to borrow money in, okay. 20, in 2028, 2027. Okay. And it should be, the council should know that municipal bond rates peak around presidential election years. Yeah. So we can have an expectation of bond rates continuing to rise in this year and in seven to eight years in the future. Yeah. The, the, the other, uh, I have, I've not done the analysis, I, you know, I certainly respect your numbers. Uh, the, the other uh, bit of information that's kind of surfaced through the analysis that we have collectively all looked at for the last several days and weeks is the fact that uh, at least beginning in the uh, 2025 fiscal year, uh, again, uh, depending on um, what, how much uh, debt we may or may not issue between now and then, um, <clears throat> you know, we will be generating a, a, a substantial surplus in our debt service fund beginning in 2025. Uh, at some point, the city would have the opportunity to make decisions about how to use those funds. Uh, we could certainly pay down or retire the potential balloon note if we elected to do that. Or those funds could certainly be used for maybe um, funding of a capital, capital needs that have kind of been deferred or will be deferred over the next three or four years out of kind of out of necessity, right? So there will be revenues available beginning in 25 and then continuing in 26 and 27 for that purpose. So. Or, or potential use. So. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, quick question in regard to the uh, uh, operational efficiencies. I know there have been some actions taken uh, thus far in the fiscal year. Have we been able to realize any savings uh, in our operational efficiencies? Um, yes, I think there have been some savings in operational efficiencies that have been identified and implemented, and you know, in the last uh, six 
months or so, six or seven months. Um, you know, those, frankly, are kind of nominal at this point. And, uh, but there are, uh, we believe, opportunities to, to, to be more efficient moving forward. And the process that Mayor Conger alluded to that has started with, with the work of the Budget Committee, but uh, we had a, uh, Mayor Conger called a, uh, a director's meeting, uh, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago now or so, and we really had our first, uh, uh, I guess, engagement with the, with the directors here in the city. You know, uh, you know, sharing with them where we are financially and 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 what we're going to to need to do moving forward. So. Thank you, you will. Mr. Mayor. Obviously, I know, and we see that we do have a problem uh, losing families and people leaving our city, going to get better schools or going to private schools. I think this is an opportunity with the private partnership that we have in and working with other entities in our to make this project happen, it's an opportunity for us now to make a major impact on two different communities. Uh, I would like to make a motion that we go uh, and partner with the private partnership uh, for this project. In part, part of your motion, Councilman, it also needs to be contingent on the comptroller's approval of our, our documents submittal. Based on uh, controllers approving. Second. We have a motion and a second. Mr. Mayor, is there no, I would like a moment of discussion before we do that, is that appropriate? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, I'd like to go back to Councilman Buchanan's question earlier. Uh, the term that we use, rainy day fund, and then how will this position us and what will that drop us down to? And from the state comptroller's office, don't we, try to go by recommendation on how much that we need to maintain and do we have an idea of that and what that fund will drop down to yes uh, first off we, we make efforts every day to be compliant with everything from the comptroller's office we, we've been working really hard on that and are fully committed to that moving forward actually some of the financial metrics that you're describing are actually asking about are actually not set by the comptroller's <coughs> office. Uh, there are municipal financial benchmarks that we have, have, have looked at. Uh, what you may be referring to, um, uh, uh, Councilman Wallace, is uh, I, I believe our audit firm uh, in their report mentioned that they would like to see based on <coughs> The city's past, where our general fund fund balance might be equal to, uh, I believe it's 25 percent of our budgeted general fund expenses. I think is is the is the, That's the measurement the metric. Um, I, I'm I'm not sure. I think right now we're somewhere around uh, 20 percent or close to that. Maybe I'm, I'm not sure. We're, we're not at 20. We're not at we're not at 25 percent. It may be even less than that. Um, so depending on what plan of action uh, the, uh, the city takes um, mo moving forward, uh, some of that could, could potentially affect our general fund, fund balance and others may not, right? So for instance, uh, reallocating property tax dollars that are currently allocated to the capital outlay fund as an example to the debt service fund that would not affect that measurement necessarily. But if we get up and if we have a situation where uh, some of our other funds, the, the debt service, if we don't take the necessary action, right, to balance the debt service fund or the solid waste fund, and um, uh, we would have to make a draw, if you will, or a transfer from the general fund. So there are, there are issues out there that, um, potentially could have a negative impact on that financial metric fund balance in the general fund as a percent of general fund expenses. What, what I would hope we would do though, if we, if we take the actions that we need to take and we uh, hopefully uh, our city, uh, let's see, Councilman Dodd, I think you were, you mentioned this idea of uh, uh, families and students leaving our city, you know, not 
you know, for, for, uh, for other schools. And if this project could contribute to keeping or drawing some of these families back, um, you know, to, to our city and um, redeveloping property in the city, hopefully we've created a scenario where um, w our city would grow, our revenues would grow, right? Um, uh, so <coughs> it's a little, I, I wish I could give you a specific answer, but it, it kind of depends on what action we decide to take, if that, if that makes sense. Mr. Chair, in a short answer to that question, Councilman Wallace, this motion does not affect our fund balance. Correct? Mm, I, I believe it would, yes, sir. Mm. We'll have to take we'll have to take action that Mr. Arnold has alluded to previously, be Does it, it through operation. Fund balance? Yeah, it, it could. Yes. I yeah. mean, again, it's <laughs> it's impossible to say right. that it will or it won't, depending on what we do, right? But it, yes, it could affect our fund balance. We're in a position either way that whether we choose to join this partnership that we're going to have to take action. I'm this. sorry? I mean, either way, we're going to have to take action. We are. Yes. Whether yes. we join this or not, yes. based off our current yes. situation. Since we have a motion in a second, I'd like to amend uh, Councilman Dodd's uh, motion to, uh, based on the recommendation from the Budget Committee, to uh, hire a professional owner representative. Um, one of the issues that we've had in the past that we've identified over the last six to eight months is uh, issues in, in project oversight. Since we're investing such a heavy amount in, uh, in this project, I think it would behoove the city to make sure that money is spent wisely and reported on uh, appropriately. Uh, and so I would move uh, to amend the motion to add the requirement that we hire a uh, professional owner represent representative to overwatch the project question and and that's if this motion passes he's, he's amending I'm amending the motion to to to, to Mr. To Councilman repeat. Dodd has a motion on the table to approve the public private partnership right. that's been presented today uh -huh. I'm amending that motion to add uh, that if 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 approved right we move forward with an owner representative based on the recommendation from the budget committee okay that that's my question second is a motion to second on the amendment any discussion or questions? Council, please vote. The motion has already been checked, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Is this on the motion? This, 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 is, this is on the amendment. This is on the amendment? Yes. And the vote is? Seven to one. One nay. And the vote passed. All right, so now we're back to the, the motion as amended. My, my, co my only comment, just kind of before we jump in here, I, I agree with Councilman Dodd that, you know, we uh, are at a crossroads kind of in our community and how we fund our schools and being a product of, of Jackson Madison County School System and having your kids in the systems, I, I see the challenges. Um, and, and a year ago or over a year ago when Dr. Jones brought this to us, um, I was in a position all for it and um, let's move forward and figure it out. Um, I, I think I, I still, I mean, it's been a, a very tough couple weeks of back and forth. Um, and in light of the moving target of the project and the changes we've seen in our current situation, um, and in light of the budget committee's uh, kind of work done there, um, I was hoping that we could come forward with other options and, and look at those. And I. I see the, the goodness that can happen from this and the future benefit, um, but I, I, as we sit here and, and we're tasked with this decision today at a special call meeting, um, I, I don't. I feel like we are being backed into a corner. Uh, this is the only option, and we must do this. Um, there's got to be other options, and, and I and I know we've kind of kicked that around, but um, at, at some point we, we have to. Um, make responsible decisions and unfortunately in the past uh, I don't feel like you know, we've made mistakes as a council in doing that um, I have and um, I, I truly hope we can figure out a way to to make this happen um, but it's a it's a very tough decision that, that's put for us today uh, and I think it's a tough decision but if we don't do it now when do we do it I mean right now we continue to 
let our schools go down and uh, not put money into our schools. And I know we keep on saying it's not the city responsibility, but I think it's a community responsibility. We're gonna have to come together and make sure we do something for our community to make our school a better place. And right now, yeah, you know, we can just take a look back, you know, just for example, the 17 Freer Complex out here that we was all against. But right now, if you go out there in that area now, the tax base that we have in that location is, is very popular for our city. So I know a lot of times a boat look right now look bad today, but you look four years down the road, probably the best thing we have did for our community. And it's putting two new inner city schools in back into our community, bringing life back into that area that's gonna be positive for us and as a whole, not just for the city, but as far as the county, school board, and also our county commission. It's an opportunity for us to show that we're collaborating together and we have to stop fighting against each other and that's do what's best for all for this whole city and come together and do what's best for our, our, our youth. Our kids need a better schools. And I think this is a start, but you know, once in, you know, that, that's gonna be just a building. But after we get these buildings in place, I think then we gotta go and put what we're gonna put inside the building. Great teachers, great resources that will come after the fact. But right now, I think either we do it now or we suffer later on down the road. Okay. Council Member Wallace. Yes, sir. I just want to make um, just a, a passionate statement also that this has been uh, very, we, we've really put a lot of work into this. And I agree with everything that we've been saying. Our school system is the most vital thing for moving our community forward. But what I would like to say together, today we must form we must come together and it needs to be the county, it needs to be the school board, and it needs to be the city. And in my belief, until we form together some type of system that we can communicate, get the same facts, get the same information, that's the way we're gonna move our city and county forward together. And I'm excited for what we've done today but I do hope in the future that we will really work closely together so everyone knows the same facts and we are leading in this transparency that we want to lead in. Mayor, if I may. Yes. Um, in, in preparing for this vote um, and even the vote that occurred uh, several years ago in, in this area, um, I have taking the opportunity to go back through many of my father's files. Many of you know my father, Dr. Ernest Brooks Sr., and his tireless work for equality and fairness in public education here in our city. And through some of that research, I've seen how my family has lived public education in Jackson. Both my parents attended Mary High, the segregated high school. I attended Jackson Central Mary. And my daughter recently graduated from Madison Academic High School. So I see the progression of our city. I've also seen where we have failed our students, our fight for unitary status over those years and, and our uh, arguments, uh, Chairman Deaton, over unitary status and our consent decree. But I think today that we have an opportunity here to right some of those wrongs and to continue my father's legacy of the fight for fairness and equity in public education here in the city of Jackson. And I'm proud uh, to vote for this uh, uh, public-private partnership today. If, I, if, I may, if I may say one thing. The, uh, to echo um, Councilman Pretty and Councilwoman Wallace, you know, this has been a very difficult process we've gone through a substantial amount of work to understand this. Um, you know, a vote of no today, if, if I was to do that, it wouldn't be because I don't want this to happen. Because I think we all know that this should happen. Uh, my vote of no would be because I just don't have confidence in it. And the reason I don't have that confidence is because all the issues that we've been brought up to now, the way that this was set up, the way that it was been presented, uh, the way it's been communicated, the way things have changed over the past six months. Uh, those things don't give me confidence in moving forward. It's not that I don't want to move forward. 
Uh, it's this, I just don't have confidence that we're doing this in the right way uh, and the way that we need to be doing it. That's the reason I don't want to move forward on it. It has nothing to do with whether or not we should be building schools because we absolutely should be. But the issue I'm having with, having with this is because I don't think we're doing this the right way. As, as uh, many have spoke today, this is a non-competitive private job that should have been bid out to multiple general contractors to make sure that the taxpayers of Jackson and Madison County are getting the lowest and best price, and we skipped over that step. Now we're depending on one entity, one person, to tell us what the cost is, and they can set that at whatever they want if we'll accept it. That's not being responsible to the taxpayers of Madison County or Jackson, Tennessee. Uh, Mr. Cobb, back in November, I outlined multiple breaches of the pre-development agreement to you. There's no action has been taken on that. Um, nothing's been taken to remedy those. Uh, nothing's been done to outline how there's been miscalculations and inaccuracies in the documents that have been presented, not only to this council, but to the to the county, to the school system, to our budget committees. Now, if I was to vote for this, after all the research that I've done, uh, the lack of plan, the plan that we don't have to pay for this and our other financial issues, that vote with the knowledge that I have, from my standpoint, would be a vote for business as usual. That's what we've ran against, is changing this. That's what I've dedicated the last six to eight months of, of trying to fix here. Um, we have to be responsible, and if we want to keep doing things this way, we will pay the consequences in the end. I know this is a very difficult dis decision, um, but we have to start doing things the right way. And I'm dedicated. That's why I ran. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm taking time away from my family and others to, to dig into this stuff and to make sure that we're doing things right. I respect that this project needs to happen. I absolutely agree that we need schools. But we have to we we have to do this in the right fashion, and I appreciate the time. Mr. Chairman, yes, sir. Straight me out on the motions. I got lost. <laughs> so, the the original motion was amended. The motion was to, to enter into the public private partnership. Say again. The the, yeah. the original motion was to enter into the public private partnership. The amendment to the motion was that we hire a. Okay, what did we vote on? We voted on we the vote amendment. On the amendment. Mm -hmm. Only. Uh, only on the amendment. <coughs> now we got the original motion with, with, with the with amendment. To have an amendment? No, my vote is no. You are, I you already voted. voted. You already I know, voted. but I, I want to vote no. You want to change your vote to no? Yeah. Okay. Can, can I clarify uh, what yes. statement? We need to take uh, vote. Morning. I just, uh, from, from one of Paul's comments, is that it, it wasn't out for a public bid. Uh, this project was out for public bid. It was uh, public notice, you know, for a uh, month. Uh, we took public uh, bids from folks from Memphis to Nashville and, and anywhere in between with a uh, priority on you know, local contractors uh, bidding this job. So, it, you know, that it, we got competitive bids. Yeah, so the bid process was controlled by a private individual, a private company, right? Correct. Yes. And so typically when we go through a bid process within the city or any other governmental bodies, that, that process is controlled by who? The, pub, the public entity so that they can ensure that they're getting the lowest and best price. And when we go through this, there's typically that's bid out to multiple contractors to ensure that those contractors can deliver the lowest and best price. This has only been bid, this has only been controlled by one contractor, a contractor who is also the developer. Uh, uh, the developer who also has people that sit on the board that approve the change orders. Uh, the, the, same part, the same individuals are in relation to the people that will be doing the oversight of the project. And so with the linearity of all those things and without additional oversight coming from outside of these other public bodies, that's what gives me the pause. I appreciate that, though. Thank you. All right. Call for, question. call for the questions. Call for the questions. What is your question? <laughs> so now we get back to the vote. The, the motion is to enter into the public private partnership with the amendment from Councilman Taylor to have a, give a term, a, uh, to hire a professional owner representative. To hire an owner representative to oversee the project for the Madison construction. This is an amendment. 
No, that no. is the, this, this is the is motion for, as amended. This is for approval of the project. Right. Yes. This is the approval of the project motion as amended. Okay. What did we vote on for this bill? The, we vote on the amendment. the amendment to the original motion. Oh, okay. this, that's, this. What I, that's what I want to know on. But okay. you know that's fine, but we're still going to vote on the project. We're still right. Right. Now yeah. we're voting on the project. Okay. Now, now the vote is on the project yeah. as amended. All right. Council, please vote. Who abstained? Oh, yeah, that's right. Council Member Pickens isn't here. Oh, I see. So the motion right, passes. Three three yes, the motion passes. And the motion passes. All right, there'll be no further discussion. The meeting is adjourned.